Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be here with all of you. In this session, we're going to be talking about the role of leadership and how corporate leaders can advance the cause of social equity and environmental justice during the energy transition. Now, for some of us, advancing social equity and environmental justice have been a lifelong passion and a mission. While for others of us, the tragic events of the past year have ignited or reignited a passion for and commitment to making our country fairer, more equitable, a country where everyone gets a fair chance at a good life, and make sure that pollution burdens don't disproportionately fall on low income and communities of color. No matter where we are on this journey, we all agree the time has come for change. We need to do better. And each and every one of us has a role to play. Corporate and government leaders can help us do better in so many ways. They can create the opportunity and an environment for difficult conversations to help advance these issues. They can create policies and incentives to align business objectives with advancing the cause of social equity and justice. They can work directly with communities to break down barriers that get in the way of progress. And they can encourage and create the opportunity for employees to develop and put into action new approaches for advancing these issues. And they can make sure their hiring practices and employee advancement result in a diverse workforce. In today's conversation, we're going to learn about four amazing women leaders and how they're advancing social equity and environmental justice in their organizations. First, we have Paula Gold Williams, former president and CEO of CPS Energy, a gas and electric utility that provides services to nearly a million customers in the San Antonio area. And in addition to her role there, she also serves on a broad portfolio of boards and committees and is the immediate past chair of the San Antonio Chamber of Commerce. So welcome Paula, thank you for joining us today. So next we have Tracy LeBeau, she is the Administrator and Chief Executive Officer at the Western Area Power Administration, or WAPA, as it's, as it's known. And she's held this position since August of 2021. So WAPA is one of four federal utilities that markets and delivers low-cost federal hydropower from 57 hydro, hydro, hydroelectric plants across 15 different states. Uh, before joining WAPA, uh, Tracy was a political appointment appointee in the Department of Energy from 2011 to 2014. So welcome, Tracy. And next we have Carla Peterman, uh, currently the Executive Vice President for Corporate Affairs and Chief Sustainability Officer for, the, for Pacific Gas and Electric, a utility that serves Northern and Central California. And earlier in her career, uh, she served a six year term as a commissioner at the California P Public Utilities Commissioner where she did an awful lot of things, including leading the adoption of the first ever utility scale uh, energy storage mandate in the country. And also investment in the adoption of electric vehicle charging infrastructure and implementation of California's renewable portfolio standard. And prior to that, she served in the California Energy Commission. So welcome, Carla. And finally, we have Kathy Zoy, who is the CEO of EVGO, a public fast charging network with stations across the United States. And she brings decades of experience in clean energy, including investing and working policy communities. And earlier in her career, she served in the Obama administration as the Assistant Secretary and Acting Undersecretary at the Department of Energy, where she oversaw investment of more than $30 billion in, in that clean energy infrastructure. And in the 1990s, she was Chief of Staff uh, for Environmental Policy in the Clinton White House, and she pioneered the Energy Star program while at EPA. So welcome, Kathy. So anyway, an incredible group of leaders here. And the way this session is going to work is I'm going to ask a series of questions to the panelists. Uh, then we're going to open it up to questions from all of you. So please do send in your questions. And this is a really great opportunity to hear firsthand from people, uh, great women who, who have so many experience in so many different ways. So 
So please do get us those. Okay, so we're gonna start. So question number one. So I think that every one of us has a personal story or an aha moment when we realize that we simply have got to be doing a better job. We need to do a better job eliminating the injustices that some people feel face every day. And we have to do a better job making sure that everyone has a chance for a good and healthy life. So I'd like to just start by asking each of you, what were your aha moments and what's your personal story? And how have these shaped the lens through which you look at social equity and environmental justice? And what does that mean to you? So I'd like to start with Paula. Uh, so welcome. Thank you for joining us. Well, Sally, thank you so much. And uh, it's very nice to, to be with all of you today and on such an important topic. Um, look, I, I think what I would start by saying is uh, I'm, a, I'm a student of the industry and I'm actually an accountant by education and training and not an engineer. And so I've, I've always looked at my opportunity to lead uh, an organization and energy as um, luck to a great degree. I've make, made a lot of uh, choices. I, I come from, um, you know, a, a, a background where there wasn't privilege uh, in my, you know, overall. And I think a lot of times when people think that they're, they're talking to CEOs that, that, that they don't, they don't know. And um, actually uh, I do know from that experience and it's always with me. And I would say that my whole life has been these micro ahas that I have been dealing with and, and just some quick revelations when we were, uh, initially coming out of the um, re the recovery period over under Obama, and we had you know given to us access to weatherization funds, and uh, it was initially through our owner, and then ultimately you know we had the ability to to go weatherize homes, and you know just to understand that we needed more programs where we could get enough assistance to really do a full service in homes that, that had, you know, um, they, they needed assistance. And, and we also worked to make sure that we did the installation ourselves. We brought in people that helped us do that. But the, the, the knowing that we were helping making people's homes tighter and really realizing that they would normally not even, a rebate pro program wouldn't, wouldn't have helped them at all. So we really began to understand that every time we did something, we needed something for every economic um, part of our community, and we needed to find as many things that could speak to people who just wanted to also participate. They want to, everybody wants to make a difference in energy. Everybody wants clean air. And, and so accordingly, you have to really be thoughtful that, that when you're doing it, you're looking for as many places to, to go in parts of town where they wouldn't normally even raise their hand, let alone uh, be able to access these programs. And then the, the last piece I would say, what we did last year is we created an outbound call group that is still in effect. And what we ended up really realizing is that most of the time utilities are actually responsive. They, they restore power, they do all these things. But we really changed our position and started calling customers very much um, focusing on customers from an economic standpoint. Um, you know, they've lost their jobs, they've lost family members. And we finally decided that it wasn't even about all of the energy. We wanted to find them programs uh, through the United Way, the food bank, all of those things. And, and a utility company historically wouldn't get into that. And it's, it's the best place for employees to be. They feel so much more um, helpful. They feel they're more mission driven. And the fact of the matter is uh, a community can't really thrive if you really have people suffering. Um, and so, so you got to do more. Okay. All right. Well, well, thank you. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like a, a really proactive approach to engagement with people instead of sitting back and waiting uh, till, you know, it's clear that there's a problem that, that you're trying to get out ahead of that. And that sounds really wonderful. So, okay, well, let's move on to uh, Tracy. Great, thank you. That's a great, and it was a great, it's a great question, Sally, because I think it can lead us into a lot of different areas. I think I've had a, a couple of ahas throughout my career um, and continue to have them. Um, and, but I think part of it, one of my initial ones early on in my career 
and and actually right after I'm law trained, uh, I've always gravitated towards law and justice issues, um, and and natural resources and how those the how those uh, issues play out, you know, in communities uh, both negatively and positively. And, uh, and part of what I think informed that and my natural gravitation towards that was uh, I am a Native American. I'm indigenous um, in, to the United States. I'm uh, a member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe in South Dakota, uh, a tribe that was, uh, you know, had some of their lands uh, inundated uh, to make way uh, for hydroelectric development. And some, you know, and so a lot of the impacts, uh, both really very positive, and some of them uh, related to, you know, the impacts on environment, lands, um, homelands, um, having to relocate and so forth, um, was something. Was something I heard from. Um, I can't even. I I actually don't remember when I first started hearing about it. Um, it affected both my both my parents, um, and so I've always been kind of hearing about. Uh, the, those types of issues uh, from very early on. And when I was uh, getting ready to graduate law school and I thought uh, one of the, uh, when I started entering into the professional, um, my, my professional career, I started, you know, thinking to myself and looking at, you know, looking at those and, um, you know, in the business and uh, being a student of that, of leadership and how people, successful people operate and move around in the, in the business, um, you know, is very, you know, very, uh, you know, aggressive, um, talk, you know, loud, um, a lot of very focused on, you know, uh, performance um, and very, you know, individually focused where I was coming from a culture and community and a family that was very, a very high value put on humility um, and very high value put on uh, you know, service to community, thinking your world view is, you know, your, your, your extended family and your community. And, you know, so it was, a, it was a tension early on, um, you know, in my career to kind of sort through how do I uh, show up in a professional workplace um, and sit, stay true to what, you know, I, the way I have been raised in my whole worldview. And, you know, that indigenous, indigenous, very particular indigenous worldview that is, you know, very, thinking long, you know, seven generations ahead, very focused on, um, you know, extended uh, familial type of relationships. Um, I am glad to kind of see um, these days, uh, and particularly right now, that I feel like the industry is more accepting of that um, and, and embracing it and seeing the value um, of those types of approaches to how we uh, develop our people, how we develop our business and what success means. And I think that that's been an aha throughout my career that I don't feel like it has to be an either or. I feel like there's a way um, to, you know, to respect and, um, and incorporate a lot of those values into how we lead. Uh, and now here I am at Western Area Power, um, who, you know, we are very, very public service oriented. Our, our workforce is incredibly passionate about the communities that we serve. Um, and that we provide low cost hydropower to low cost clean energy to and how that is real a real building block uh, for a lot of very rural and a lot of disadvantaged communities throughout our 15 state footprint. Um, and so that that resonates very deeply with me. And I'm just so proud and, and uh, thankful to be working at a place that and with people that it, it, it means just as much. Oh, thank you, thank you. So, so uh, Carla, um, maybe we'll move on to you. Sally, um, well, in terms of my own personal story, I got interested in energy first from an interest in environmental justice. I went to a historically black college and took an environmental justice course and very much thought I would be an environmental attorney. I was very moved by efforts to close power plants, deal with local air pollution. And then I had a professional aha moment in graduate school where I started learning about economics and energy. And I said, well, I could have a more of an impact or just a different type of impact if I'm involved in the production of energy itself. If we can design energy systems in a way that are more just and equitable at the onset, that is an easier process than after the fact, trying to dismantle an energy system and deal with consequences. Because at that point, we've already suffered the community impacts. Um, so 
in that, I pursued this career in energy and working in utility regulation, now at a utility. And I've always been struck by the fact that we are trying to solve for very complicated things that really seem hard to solve altogether. Safety, reliability, clean, particularly in California, um, and affordable. Um, and so there have been times where my career where I felt pretty helpless and then oftentimes frustrated when environmental justice advocates would say, but you need to do more, but you need to do this. And I think, oh, if they only understood how technically hard this is and how what we're already doing is on the cutting edge, you know, then they would give us, they would understand more. Um, and then I, the aha moment I had related to that was I was in a community workshop at one point and we were talking about what it really means to have a community centric ESG focused policy. And the comment was, first of all, you can't do it at the end. You've got to build it into the beginning. And then also the community members are experts in their community. They don't need to be experts on the technical system. They don't need to be experts in energy. Like that's my job. Their job is to bring forward and represent what is happening to them and their community. And it is, it is core to my job to integrate that. And so that stopped me from feeling frustrated or helpless and more so feeling empowered that I have this awesome responsibility and opportunity to take that input, take that expertise, combine, combine it with technical expertise and economic expertise to deliver. Um, the last aha moment I wanted to share was when I was a regulator, I remember dealing with a rate case where community members came forward and said a $5 a month rate increase was too much. And I thought, okay, $5, you know, that's a, a latte. But it's like, these folks aren't buying lattes. You know, people were very compelling and saying, this for me is a choice. It's a choice between this or food. This is a choice between shelter. And it really struck me just the perspective there that every increase matters for someone and just how important it is to make sure we've got that safety net to make sure that everyone can access these essential services and again, that even if it's hard, it's my job to keep trying to do better and better each time. Okay, great, thank you. Well, there's a lot to unpack in all of these remarks. <laughs> we, we could talk about this a lot. Maybe we'll get back to some of these things. So, uh, so Kathy, how about you? Yeah, look, I, I, what a great forum and a great conversation just so far. I'm like, I'm absorbing it all. Um, for my part, I, I studied geology and engineering and that, Back then, um, I was, it was very rare to be a woman in energy. I spent my career in energy. And I ever sh never actually really thought much about it. Like I was the oldest of three daughters. I had no brothers. So I always had to do the things that traditionally in my vintage, the boys would have to do. So, and my father said, off you go. So I wasn't conscious of it actually, particularly about, about women, about the, the potential bias against women in energy until I got to Silicon Valley. In government, it felt fine. In the utility world, it actually felt pretty okay. In Silicon Valley, when I arrived after I left the Obama administration, it, or, uh, it, it felt uh, still quite, there was a lot of unconscious bias. So when I moved to EVgo, what I have tried to do is, is ensure that we actually open the aperture and, and, take the, and, and embrace the points of view of everybody. And again, I think we're gonna get to it in a, further in this conversation, but I'd love to actually talk a little bit about the, the journey that EVgo was on to try to get eliminate unconscious bias and to enable electric for all because it's a wide spectrum of activities and it is indeed a journey. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, you bring up the, the issue of, of women uh, in clean energy and, and, and we've heard a, a number of different takes on that. I, I think that, you know, adding sort of an aha moment for me because I also was not terribly um, sensitized to, you know, the, some of the challenges of, of, uh, of, uh, of all, all different kinds of people. But uh, one of the things that would always uh, frustrate me is to be standing next to a man uh, and, and have everybody walk right by me, all the dignitaries walk right by me and walk up to the man right next door and say, well, hello. And it's like, well, you know, hi, I'm here too. And uh, yeah, and, 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 and that's just a very little uh, tiny, I think, sliver into what it feels like to be disregarded uh, and just intentionally overlooked. So uh, there's a lot of work to do uh, in, in that regard. So, so I want to move on now to uh, to solutions to you know how how you as corporate leaders can can make a difference and you know 
I think having heard your backgrounds and you're running these large and complex organizations, and can you talk about some of the specific things that you've done to try to create an environment where social equity and environmental justice are central to the way you go about doing your business? And I think we'll start with Tracy. Thank you. Certainly, thank you. So I think on the people side, uh, one of the one of the uh, very intentional things that this organiz that our organization did a few years ago was, you know, of course, like everyone else, we're looking at, you know, we were hearing about um, diversity and inclusion, and you hear it all the time, DNI, 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 and uh, we had a very intentional conversation about how that looked for us, um, and uh, the the decision was made. Uh, consensus decision was made that we're going to start, we're going to stand up an inclusion and diversity uh, committee. Now that doesn't sound like, you know, like, okay, fine. You reverse the word, the, the words. Um, now it was very intentional that, you know, we, we folk, we, the focus out the gate was on inclusion. I think the diversity part of it uh, was a, for us almost a little bit of a given that we knew we had to do work on the inclusion part of it. Um, and so since then we have been, um, we have been training to unconscious bias uh, very, you know, throughout the entire organization. And, uh, and we're still doing that work. Uh, we feel like we still got work to do uh, on the inclusion part of it before we start tackling equity and, you know, in, in, in um, you know, it, it, in the next year or two. Of course, it's on our mind. We work with communities uh, across our 15 state footprint. Um, we have over 700 customers that we sell wholesale uh, hydro to. Um, so we're just, and we have, and all of our folks are throughout all of those communities. So it's not, you know, we're not sitting in, you know, one spot and, uh, and not living, but we are living in those communities. So um, that perspective um, that our folks bring back every single day is just critically important. We want we always make sure that we have those voices at, in the room. We've also started doing blind um, application processes for some of our leadership programs. Um, and so that's been really interesting to see how that's played out. It's played out very positively. Um, it has changed the a number of uh, women um, that are you know, being selected into some of our um, training and leadership development programming. Um, and then last, I think for our, you know, turning, you know, looking a little, pivoting a little bit towards the equity part of it, because we are, I mean, we are paying attention to it, um, but I don't think we've settled on exactly, you know, what our priorities are going to be in that. But we've got a bit, of, you know, we've got a bit of um, equity built into, kind of baked into our organization in the sense that, you know, this, uh, our, our 17,000 miles of transmission um, that we own and operate and maintain it was originally built to take um, hydro into kind of those last miles, um, into those very rural communities um, that desperately needed, you know, low cost power to really, um, you know, help them establish a, a more sustainable economy. And that's something, you know, we take very, very seriously and very committed to, to maintaining, you know, maintaining that low cost and to provide those that value to our to those um, to, you know those 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 rural and disadvantaged communities. So, thanks, Sally. Yeah, maybe just to follow up a, a little on that. I mean, I, I think it's people don't really know that there are still people who lack access to electricity in this country, and and particularly on on Native American lands and and and. You know, I think that's just, it's crazy. I mean, we should do better than that. And, uh, and it sounds like, like you're, you're trying to do that. And, and, and are, you, are you making progress? Are you confident that we're going to get there? I am, um, you know, and the department writ large, right, is, has, has been focused on that. I mean, Congress uh, very intentionally passed the Energy Policy Act in 2005 to establish programs and funding and authorities um, to, you know, to really assist in those areas and not to just uh, run, you know, run poles and wires out to homes, but really to, you know, uh, you know, help provide that type of, um, you know, technical assistance and, and funding um, to those rural communities, uh, indigenous communities throughout the U.S. 
um, to you know help them develop uh, you know community power projects, um, you know residential type of projects, and 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 in clean energy. Um, so I think you know we are making progress up on that for sure. Um, you know, but it is the irony uh, of it uh, in terms of U.S. history that a lot of the oil and gas production that uh, happened in, you know, throughout last century, a lot of the coal production and, and uh, was, in fact, you know, in those territories and, and largely exported, right? And so not that, that value chain not really captured in those communities. And one of the exciting things about, you know, the, you know, the, the current um, you know, approaches is to really try to, uh, the whole equity conversation is really, uh, as we approach this, you know, new push on infrastructure and clean energy, um, let us find a way to make those investments in those native communities. Um, and so very excited about that. Yeah, well, that's great. To, that's great to hear. Uh, so, so Kathy, I, I know you're doing a lot of exciting things. You want to talk about your programs? Yeah. So, so EVGO tends to be a very mission-oriented place. We attract people who not only want to have a good job in a growing industry, but who want to help address climate change. And and that, that I think that empathy for the environment extends to empathy for humanity. And I don't that that may sound Pollyannish, but what, what what's it, what was interesting and challenging is at the tragic events of George Floyd's murder. There was a lot of people across the organization were quite up, quite upset legitimately. So what we did is we we did a survey and said, look, well, what can we do about this? We're an action oriented place. What can we do? We had the vast majority of people across EVGO said, here are my thoughts, here's what I do. We, we put those into, we created a bunch of working groups that, that touched on training and unconscious bias, recruiting more effectively to, to take advantage of diverse points of view in, in helping the organization grow. Advancement within the organization once people were there, because it turns out that across the top of the organization, we're pretty monochromatic and we need to do better than that. Um, People also said, how can we be more engaged in our communities? Like literally we, EVGO is, you know, our headquarters is in, is in LA. How do we get more involved with disadvantaged communities and communities of color? And then how can our business be a, truly about advancing electric for all? So each of those had specific action plans were, were employee led. Um, and we, we have integrated all of those actions into our OKRs, our objectives and key results. So we measure our progress in each of those areas quarter by quarter. So let me give you an example on the electric for all. When we cite charging stations like the one behind me, we actually put them through an, an EJ screen. The EPA has come up with an environmental justice screen and we make sure that we are not just putting charging infrastructure in wealthy white neighborhoods. And that's part, that is now a core part of our business. Um, and we, we, you know, as we extend across the country, um, we have adopted some, some local community uh, charities that, are, that our folks are getting involved in. Um, even, and even though we're national, we do these things. So uh, there is just a variety. For me, um, yes, we need to grieve and discuss things when they happen badly, but we need to then turn those into progress and action. And I would say, as I say, it's a work in progress. We are not perfect. It's going to be continuous improvement. We're going to measure, though, our progress. And I'm, and I'm really proud of the, the widespread employee engagement across EVGO. Oh, that's, that's great to hear. And how do your employees respond to, to this? Well, they, everybody responds really, really well, unless they have to co-chair a committee and they say they don't have time for it. <laughs> but, but no, but that's really practical. Every, like, as I say, like in 80% of folks put up their hand and say, I want to be on that task force. I want to be on that task force. So there is there. And, and when we did the, we did some training on unconscious bias, it was a hunt, it was mandatory training, but we had total commitment in the breakout sessions. And, and, and again, this is, there were people that were moved to tears that, that in, in a way that was extremely constructive and very showing vulnerability in a work setting. That So the, I, I say, I, I just continue to be buoyed by the, the acknowledgement that we need to all continue to work together to make this better. Okay, thank you. Uh, Carla. Well, uh, PG&E is a large company. We have 25,000 employees and 15,000 contractors, and we serve 16 million people. And so what's awesome, I think, about being at a utility is that we represent the communities that we serve in. You know, we're actually living them. Our, we're customers as well as um, coworkers. And so 
our purpose statement at pg e which we refined this year, is delivering for our hometowns, serving the planet, and leading with love. And it's the leading with love part that people are a little surprised about to hear from a utility. And we talk about that a lot. What does that mean when you lead with love? It is starting from a place of commitment, of recognizing that we are imperfect. In many ways, we are most imperfect in our relations with people we love the most, but we stick with it and we work through things. So we start with that framework and we've been working with all of our coworkers about what does that mean in terms of our engagement with our community? What does that mean in terms of our work on safety, environment, social justice? And so we're doing some of the things that others have raised as well, targeting um, uh, you know, screens in our projects, targeted work with our charitable. But one thing I wanted to highlight is our work on psychological safety the importance of constantly talking with our coworkers about what a psychologically safe environment is, where you ask questions, where you speak up, where you raise issues, where you challenge each other. Because if you don't feel psychologically safe, then we're not gonna surface when we don't see ESJ being appropriately treated in our work. Um, and managing an external oriented organization, and I've got the reps who are in the field who are working with our tribal partners, for example, our disadvantaged communities, having them feel safe to raise issues and say to the engineer, you know what, I get it, we gotta do this reliability, but we didn't co-create this the way we should have with our community is first and foremost um, a matter of really importance. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to say is like putting resources at it, I mean, Kathy got on this, but um, within my organization, I have an environmental social justice manager whose full-time job is working to make sure we are working appropriately with the communities we have an environmental social justice policy. We just developed our human rights policy. So it's also putting in, sometimes people don't, people want to do the right thing. They don't know what that means. So it's starting to give that guidance from the, from the top down as well. So psychological safety allows for our coworkers to bring their perspective to this. And so it's ground up. And then having these policy statements at the highest C-suite level really give that direction that this is a priority for our company. Thank you. You know, I, I, I like that you talk about a psychologically safe environment. And what I also think about is just trust, you know, to, to have a safe environment, you have to trust people. And, and actually, this is the second time in your remarks that you sort of brought up this idea of, of well, what to me underpinned it was trust. You mentioned that, you know, when you were working with the communities, it's the community's job to, to advocate for their concerns and bring forward their concerns. And, and it's your job to bring forward technologies and, and so forth. But for that to work in the end of the day, there really has to be trust uh, on, on both parts. And, you know, I think the question is how do we create this more trusting society uh, that is trustworthy and trusting. Well, you know, I gotta say too, when being at a utility and being in government, these are institutions that have been around over a hundred years. Um, and so there's a long history of circumstances where we haven't had trust, right? And we talk a lot about how the trust bank is easy to withdraw from and hard to add to. And so first and foremost, I think just acknowledging where you haven't done right. You know, we're owning, owning, owning our history and owning our desire to do better. Sometimes people just want to hear from you that you understand that things haven't been going as well as they should have, right? And then I think it's just showing up, demonstrating, saying, like, you know, the listening, learning, responding. I mean, I love it when we get what might be an issue that's a small issue, right? But we're able to fix it because you never know who you're fixing it for, right? That person go tell their neighbor and they tell their neighbor and their neighbor's the mayor, who knew, right? And so I just think it's a lot... It's a long-term commitment, and that's why we have love as a part of our mission, which is like we are in it for the long haul because we want to serve people for the next hundred years. And so I just think you have to have that mentality. Yeah, yeah no, thanks. I think that's so important. Um, okay, Paula, on to you. Okay, um, so a couple things that I would share, in, in, um, and it may sound counterintuitive. So um, I, I have served this community. I'm born and raised in it. And when I became CEO as an African-American um, leader, as an African-American person, in reality, it, it kind of felt like the reverse racism conversations would come, you know, were, were kind of an undercurrent, right? Okay, here we got an African-American leader. She's going to be talking about diversity, inclusion. What does that mean? Does that mean quotas? Um, you know, and, and, and the conversations, although... 
um, you know, would, would touch on these aspects are people get, going to get potentially either awarded jobs or contracts with us and they won't necessarily be the best performing entities. And I, I, you know, I think the art for me has been in the conversation and to look past uh, this, the fears of what those unintended consequences are. And then when people would say, well, is it possible that we didn't pick the best candidate that or the best vendor because, you know, we, we were looking for a diverse vendor. And I, you know, just having the conversation with people that, that, that again, that's an unconscious bias Let's have a conversation about that. We put people up against the same criteria all the way around, but I think what we really had to be honest about was why did even our pools not reflect diversity in our selection? And, and that taking that extra time to look for more candidates in the organization or more candidates in your community or more companies, and we're, we're in that process. Can we find more companies that can do this work. Now there is an element when you're a utility, you're not doing um, you're not doing a lot of general work. In some cases, you're, you might you're in for us, we're the only utility in town. And so also encouraging people to get into aspects of what we do. And, and now we've had to go a bit further in the education process when we're dealing with vendors. Let us tell you what our business is. Let us talk to you about where our business, where our, our industry is going are you interested in doing work with us and being in this space and really learning more about how to expand your business model to, to affect us and benefit us? And so the art of conversation has been, I think, the real key for us. And I, and I still believe that we're on this learning journey to, to make that happen. And again, the, the last piece I will say, um, and you can't talk enough about it. You can't, you can't try too hard. Um, it's something that you have to have all the time. I love Kathy's comment about um, blind, you know, blind application processes. And, and we, we've done that too. To, and, and it's interesting. People go, I, I didn't realize I was looking for someone who was reflecting both my background and my values and, um, and, and really not looking for the, the essence of their technical ability and their character. So I, I would tell you, the, this is a journey that CPS Energy has been on. We have a very diverse team here. Um, we try a lot of things. We move people out of their expertise into other roles. We call them executive and residence programs or intern programs. That way they don't have the bias of having to have a pedigree to do something. And then we get to get at the essence of them learning and growing as fast as the organization. And we've had great results with that. Yeah, yeah that's good. I mean, you, you started the conversation with, um, uh, you know, the, the sort of presumptive view that sometimes that, you know, by picking a, a diverse candidate or a woman candidate, that it's because the, of, of that. And, and I don't think people understand how undermining that is to all of the individuals. You know, I think all of us as women probably at one time or another have, have felt that people think that, well, we're in these jobs because we're women. And, and that's so undermining. I think we just have to work so hard at changing that narrative. And uh, yeah, so, so uh, how, how, is it, how is it going? I, I mean, are, you, are you feeling like we're making progress and that that uh, the people are shifting the way they think, and that that they're really you know viewing you know candidates on their own merits. And I do. I, I again, I think it's one of those things that you know it's like rubber band. If you don't if you don't constantly make it part of what you're trying to do, that you you will slip back. Um, you know, I, I know I've talked to people. I've, I've sent men to women's conferences so they can feel like what it feels like to be <laughs> in the minority. <laughs> and that's when, I mean, like I look for those kind of experiences or when we're looking for candidates and I don't see any women in the pool. Um, you know, I start asking questions and, and I specifically drill down, like, what about Mary, right? Why, why, is, why is Mary not in this pool? And, and when people say, well, you know, We've been working with her, but you know she's probably about a year away. And I said, you know what? I asked you last time. She told you told me she was a year away. I said because she's still not there. You know whose fault that is? That's our fault. 
Because if we didn't identify what we needed to do for Mary, um, and we keep telling her she's a year away, then the failure is we're not great leaders and we're not building talent behind us. I talk about this all the time. You got to build, ta build talent behind you for you to have opportunity to do other things. You got to be making sure the, the, the whole company is growing. So those conversations are uncomfortable. Oftentimes, you know, people are trying to figure out where I'm coming from. And, and, and really and truly, I just want to make sure again that people get treated fairly and they get a chance and they get a chance to grow. And nobody's born an executive or born a pres, you know, president, a VVP, a, you know, a business leader. It, there's so much that we can do for others. And then again, that extends to what you do for others um, in your mentorship outside of the company and helping, you know, uh, with, with students get, you know, um, associated and kind of immersed in our, in our, what we do as an industry and how exciting that is, but you got to care. You got to be, you got to care enough to challenge your own beliefs about what you should be looking for. And again, I still say, say it's a balance of technical, but even more so these, the qualitative emotional intelligence for someone to, to really be a balanced leader, uh, let alone a balanced um, team member. And you might as well look for people with very diverse backgrounds uh, in that and be conscious about it. So it's, it's something that you just got to continue to go through. We've made a quite a bit of progress, but I think it's, we, we could bounce back. So um, the leaders behind me, um, we have our first Hispanic CEO that is um, taking on the interim spot as I'm transitioning. I'm really proud of him. And again, our, our team is just, you know, they, they just come with great substance and, um, and they think about talent in, in a better way now than I think we did five or 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. You know that, that, thank you. That I, I think what you said is going to really stick with me for a long time. If you have someone who keeps, you know, every time it's only a year, a year out, you're a year or two out. It really, it's, it's a reflection more on the organization and then the environment that people find themselves in if we're not helping people advance. So I, I think that's really, uh, that's really insightful. Yeah. Well, well, thank you. Um, Okay, what I wanted to do now is to have a conversation really amongst, uh, amongst all of us about, you know, what are the things that, that you think work the best? So if we imagine we've got, you know, this incredible C3E uh, audience here listening to this and many of them are, you know, emerging leaders and, and they need to know what are, what, what are the things that work the best and, and what are things that you've tried that actually haven't worked at all? Because I, I think that's equally important to understand, you know, what's not worth the time or at least, you know, if, if you're going to try it again, do it differently. And, uh, and, and maybe, Kathy, if you want to start and then really just, um, you know, just chime in and, and let's kind of figure out, let's give some good tools for success. Oh, you're on mute, Kathy. For me, I, I think I separate the activities a little bit into what are we doing internally for our own organizational DNA? And then what are we doing for our business? So on the first category, what are we doing internally organizationally for our DNA? I think, I think you know, both Carla and Paula hit on this. The art of conversation, the safe, creating a safe space to discuss, to have everybody discuss is incredibly important. Translating those good ideas that come from all over the place and places in the organization that you might not expect integrating them into a, into a formalized program where you're going to measure your progress. Like those, the, it's the same tools that we apply to our core business that we need to apply to diversity, equity, and inclusion issues and how we run the businesses. So that's, that's sort of what I would say, like really, really has been helpful to us again, in, in, in all the different categories. When it comes to like, how do we do the business externally? And for us, that's electric for all and making sure that that mission um, is translated into building charging infrastructure for all kinds of people in all kinds of places that's convenient and reliable. Again, measuring it, adding filters to ensure that when we site and when we invest our investors' capital and like each one of our stations can cost a million bucks, that's real dough. But we're doing it through the lens of are we, are we, are, if we build this charging infrastructure there, is it helping to advance our mission? So again, it's the same business principles that we apply to our core business of measuring your progress, and, but including these other factors. And guess what? We are able to do it. I would say the thing quickly, the thing that, that we've actually struggled with, I, I referred to this obliquely before, is 
the idea of spreading the diversity, equity, and inclusion responsibilities across the organization or centralizing them someplace, again, sort of as Carla referred to, she's got a person who's responsible for it. We're still struggling with the best way to do that. If it's across the organization, you're sure lots and lots and lots of people are involved in this, their, it's their points of view. At the same time, we don't make as much progress as quickly if somebody doesn't actually own it. And that's just a classic one of those organizational issues. I'd love everybody else, everybody else's thoughts on if they've got the answer here, because we're still struggling. Uh, so, so the rest of you, and any uh, any thoughts or follow up to Kathy's question? Hey, this is uh, this is Paula. Actually, Kathy would say that we struggle with the same thing as you know as well. What, what's the best way to do that? Um, we, I, I still believe that that for us, when I when when we have done this thing where we picked a person and put their name on a program like um, uh, diversity or, or even um, strategy, right? Or innovation, interestingly, right? It, it actually has a counter effect sometimes. It feels like, oh, well, they'll tap me on the shoulder when I need to do that. Or um, I guess they're lucky because they get to be the ones that, that champion this and, and I'm gonna just kind of be reactive and utilities have a, a our general DNA is to fix things, to react to things, to, to restore power, to fix something that's broken, to, um, you know, call a customer back. Uh, and so for me and, and my leadership, I've, I've really tried to get more and more people to understand that strategy is part of your job. Innovation is part of your job. Um, thinking like you want to develop talent and, and, and ensuring that the talent pool that you're looking at when you're making individual hiring uh, decisions is as important as anything that's done anywhere else in, in the community. So I get the whole thing about that. What I try to do, uh, have tried to do in the past too, is to get every um, senior leader in our organization to own that within their own organizations. But, but that's complicated too. I don't think it's been perfect. I think maybe it should be a bridge of both. And that's something that I think, uh, you know, my successor is gonna have an opportunity to focus on. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in here. I, I agree with um, just all the same, especially your last point, Paula, about how it is both. Um, I think about it two ways. I mean, one on one hand, anything that we're serious about doing, there's people who have expertise in that. Right. And we can tell people, you know, everyone should own uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion, but there are professionals who have studied this, who have figured out the best ways to do this. And I think it's important to honor, honor that and hire people who where this is our expertise. Um, but that being said, also make it a part of what people are expected to think about constantly as leaders. I'll give the equivalence to safety. You know, at pg e we thought a lot about our safety journey and really invested in that. Um, the same when I was at Edison in the PUC. And you have your coworkers who are focused on the discipline of safety, um, but we also expect everyone to own safety. So one of the things I ask my leaders on a regular basis in our check-ins, and this is what I would say is kind of a, I think a good practice is, we say, how are you, how have you owned safety as a leader? Um, how are you living our safety stand as a leader? And for corporate affairs, again, you know, not our operational folks, it can be a harder question, but we've learned how to understand really what that means for us, including um, physical system safety as well as psychological. But then also asking that question, how are you owning our diversity, equity, and inclusion stand? How are you demonstrating that as a leader? Incorporating that fully in the performance review at the end of the year. You know, have you been a safety leader? Have you been a DEI leader? I think by asking the question, sometimes people just don't reflect on what they can do. And when you start to say you have to do something, they start to realize that they have more power than they do. So I think it is a hybrid. I can chime in a little bit. Um, hi, hi, Kathy. So I, before I do, though, I want to I want to um, I want to shout out to Kathy when I uh, was uh, being recruited into the uh, Obama administration. Um, the first call after uh, the White House was Kathy called me and was recruited me into DOE. So thank you. Um, nice to see you. <laughs> and so, um, you know, for us, you know, uh, the struggle is, is real. Um, we have uh, 
established an inclusion and diversity committee across the organization. And we were very uh, thoughtful about um, both getting management and you know, staff, um, but also pulling out, you know, uh, reaching out to the craft to make sure that we've got linemen um, represented and engineering represented. Um, so we were really very thoughtful about kind of the up and down and across. Um, and then we've uh, established, and then we have executive sponsors to have, you know, some um, not total ownership, but guidance um, over you know, how, how things get rolled out. And much like uh, what Carla was just talking about with safety, we're also um, rolling out a uh, human performance, just culture um, initiative across the organization. Cause we just really want to infuse safety across the entire organization. And I feel a little bit, I feel the same about inclusion and diversity um, because I think it needs to get owned across kind of across the board and um, thanks. Yeah, I, I think that the Carla's uh, comment about safety is really interesting. So in the Department of Energy Labs, um, at, there was a time when safety performance wasn't as good as people wanted it to be. And the Department of Energy rolled out an integrated safety management program that was a hybrid model with deep expertise, but also distributed uh, responsibilities throughout the organization. And what really struck me is, is the training was actually so good and so profound and measured so well that I actually carried it home to my personal life. And so all of a sudden my house, my family, you know, walking on unsafe places, you know, I was just hyper aware. And, and I think that that's a huge opportunity if the workplace could also be a place that makes us think not only about when we're working, but thinks about our home and our community. And if we could get diversity, equity, inclusion, you know, part of that fabric, that could be really a catalytic in terms of helping to advance this much more broadly. So we've got great questions from the audience um, and we're using Slido. So the way this works is that somebody puts up a question and then other people can vote for it. And so these are ranked according to uh, what you're all most interested in. So we'll start off with the, the first one. And it says, does the conventional imperative of C Corp profit hinder energy equity? And the second part is, should all shareholder utilities be V, corpse, profit plus purpose? So, uh, yeah, and I think this is for any and all of you who would like to comment on that. Well, I, I, look, I, I think what I would add is... Um, we're we're here in San Antonio. We're we're a business owned by a community, but the fact of the matter is, um, especially before COVID, right? We all realized that the world was small. Um, I had the uh, fortune of talking to CEOs in different countries. The energy issues that are out there are are fairly common. Um, uh, whether you know you're, you're working to get away from fossil fuels, and the fact of the matter is, there's just a whole lot more investment that has to happen in trying to figure out how to take base load plants and replace them with green, green or and clean technologies, and to get to these goals. So, so that is a real thing, um, coupled with the social justice. You know, when you watch social justice issues, and you and I, I always say you know, what, what the sacrifice that we took um, in losing Mr. George Floyd to something that historically was associated with hate and racism that is not new. This is, the, you know, that reflection um, just brought forward, you know, hundreds of years of, of issues and discrimination. So this is now squarely in our lives. Energy issues are squarely in our lives. And so I think every organization and, and particularly a business needs to have the dynamic of how to make to be viable moving forward, but also making sure that these aspects of um, how do you do it in the most socially just way? How do you improve the environment? How do you make sure that people are kept safe, that people are felt that, that they feel like their, their energy systems are secure 
um, and making sure that everyone has the ability to afford an essential service. Um, all of those things have to be wrapped up in balance, whether or not you are um, in one aspect or another. But I think businesses no longer have the opportunity to just go to the fat financial bottom line. And I'm a financial person. You've got to do it through this, this additional prism. And, and hopefully I'm, I'm addressing some of the, the, the uh, interest there on both sides in that question. Okay, and I'll, I'll just a quick thought on that. Well, I was just going to add, um, yeah, I agree with Paula and just say, first of all, it's in our investors' interest that we incorporate environmental social justice because we need our customers to pay their bills and everyone's our customer. Um, yeah, so that's first and foremost. And so if they're not able to afford their bills, it's a problem for us. Um, it's also an issue where if they're not happy with their service, we're also regulated entities. And so our regulator will, will come down and give us direction. So the more we can solve that ourselves. And then just practically, we're seeing investors highlight why this is important. So people feel it's important, investors feel it's important because they feel socially motivated. But again, it's good financial interest. The explosion we have seen in ESJ uh, ratings, metrics, um, services that are being used by investors reporting. Um, you have the SEC looking at rules around you know, climate change risk disclosures. There's so much a focus on environment, sustainability, um, human rights that it is just becoming a fundamental part of what we do and what we're reporting out to investors in terms of how we run our business. Okay, I think we're gonna move on to the next question because uh, we're actually starting to run out of time. But uh, so this, this part of the sponsorship of C3E are a number of universities. So I think that's the, where this question is coming from. But the question is, is how can education support the triple challenge of sustainability, workforce diversity and environmental justice? Well, I'll jump in again. Um, San Antonio, uh, seventh largest uh, city in the US, but we have a huge um, issue still with uh, low, low graduation rates from, from high school. And we also have uh, literacy issues here. Um, it's, not, it's not rampant, but when, um, I mean, it's not the majority, but if you have like 25% of your population that have these challenges, you understand that structurally uh, your community is gonna have this element of, of suffering. But I, I think we here at CPS Energy really believe that education is the key, both in terms of foundationally making sure that, that when, you know, we're at, reaching out to parts of the community where it's not maybe as, as comfortable for them. I mean, just going through the pandemic and realizing how important the digital divide was that impacted students um, you know, those kind of things and, and, and what we can do to help kids catch back up again, talk to them about their careers, keep them interested and really encouraging them to go to college. We have a lot of colleges and universities in town, but we have this huge gap about people who don't think that they, that their college material or, or those kind of things, but we're not going to, we're not going to solve these energy issues if we don't get more and more people um, educated, involved from every aspect of a career. You don't have to be an engineer to have an impact on this industry. Um, what you really have to have is passion, creativity, and, a, and an interest in solving problems as we talked about earlier. So if we don't, we, we've got to fix this educational um, gap that I don't think in some cases are, is really getting smaller. It's, it's uh, substantially structurally in some ways, either staying a constant big issue or getting bigger. Um, you know, unconsciously as, as we're trying to solve other problems. Yeah, Sally, if I could just chime in to add on, I mean, Paula focused uh, more on the, on the high school education. I would say um, when it comes to the university level stuff and during my wonderful years of working with you closely teaching kids at Stanford, I think the thing that, that's, that we were doing that was really appealing is we, were, we, were, we had a multidisciplinary approach it almost builds on what Paula was saying about you don't need to be an engineer. The classes that I taught had engineers, historians, English majors, poets, people from the business school, all coming together collectively to say, look, we're looking for a clean energy future. What can we do together to invent tomorrow? And those multidisciplinary programs often, often have challenges getting funded or sustained funding support from university, from university leadership because 
professors tend to be very, you know, like I, this is my discipline. I got a PhD in this thing, but I actually think the benefit of having multidisciplinary, you know, training at, at the university level is incredibly profoundly important for changing the world. And Sally, I would, I would just want to chime in. I, I would agree. I would agree with that, Kathy. I think you know, um, right before COVID, I was teaching at Stanford as well. And I tell you that, you know, the, the passion and multi, multidisciplinary um, students that we got, I um, was teaching on sustainability and clean energy, and that such passion and interest and multi, multidisciplinary approach was just amazing. And I think for, as far as academia goes, we just really got to continue the work of getting diverse um, student bodies <laughs> in there to bring their perspectives um, as well. So th thanks, Sally. Okay, well, thank you. You know, we've actually come to the time when we need to wrap up. So I want to thank the panelists for bringing your experiences, knowledge, and wisdom, and, and so being so engaging uh, on this discussion. And thank you all for your leadership. I feel much more comfortable knowing that the, the wonderful people like you all are in the, the, the helm of these important companies. And thank you for inspiring us all to do better, uh, to give us ideas about how every day we can do our own parts to make the world more equitable and more just for everyone. So thank you very much. And, uh, and to the audience, uh, thanks for joining us and uh, we hope you enjoyed it.